part three of this very long essay. If you want to see the beginning or, or, or read the beginning of it, go back to the previous video, please. All the uh, neoliberal guru can't about solving the world's poverty problems by unlocking the hidden micro-entrepreneurial spirit of every starving third world a third world country is put into practice by Omidyar's network investments. Charity without profit motive is considered suspect at best, subject to the laws of unintended consequences. Good can only come from markets. Uh, unleashed, and that translates into an ideology inherently, inherently hostile to government, democracy, public politics, redistribution of land and wealth, and anything smacking of social welfare or social justice. In literature published by the Omidyar Network, the assumption is that technology is an end in itself, that it is that it naturally creates beneficial progress and that the world's problems can be solved most effectively with the for-profit business solutions. The most charitable thing one can say about Amidiar's non-profit network is that it reflects at uh, that it reflects all the worst cliches of contemporary neoliberal faith. In reality, it's much worse than that. In many regions, Omidyar network investments have helped fund programs that create worsening conditions for the world's underclass, widening inequalities, enhancing exploitation, pushing millions of people into crippling debt, and supporting anti-poverty programs that, in some cases, result in mass suicides by the rural poor. Pierre Amidiar was one of the biggest early backers of the for-profit micro-lending industry. Through the Omidyar network, as well as personal gifts and investments, he has funneled around $200 million into various micro-lending companies and projects over the past decade, with the goal of establishing an investment-grade microfinance sector that would be plugged into Wall Street and into global finance. The neoliberal theory promised to unleash billions of new micro-entrepreneurs. The stark reality is that it saddled untold numbers with crushing depth, depth and despair. One of the, his first major investments into microlending came in 2005 when Pierre Omidyar and his wife Pam gave Tufts University, their alma mater, a hundred million to create the Omidyar Tufts Microfinance Fund and to manage a managed for-profit fund dedicated to jumpstarting the growth of the microfinance industry. At the time, Tufts announced that Omidyar's gift was the largest private allocation of capital to microfinance by an individual or family. With the Tufts Fund, Omidyar wanted to go beyond mere charitable donations to specify uh, to specific micro-lending organizations that targeted the developing world's poorest. At the same time, he wanted to create a whole new environment in which for-profit micro-lending companies could be self-sustaining and generate big enough profits to attract serious global investors. This idea was at the core of Amidiar's vision of philanthropy. He believed that microfinance would er eradicate poverty faster and better if it was run on a for-profit basis and not like a charity. If you want to, if you want to reach, he says, if you want to reach global scale, and we're talking about hundreds of millions of people who need this, you can't do it with philanthropy capital. There's not enough charity capital out there. By connecting with an institutional investor, 
like a university, we would like to increase the level of professional investor involvement in this sector to try to stimulate more commercially viable investment products. Pierre Omidyar said in an interview at the time. You can look all of this up and we can post the entire article below. We ought to be looking at business as a force for good. The idea behind the microloans is very simple and seductive. It goes something like this. The only thing that prevents hundreds of millions of people living in extreme poverty from achieving financial success is their lack of access to credit. Given them access to microloans, referred to in Silicon Valley as seed capital, and these would be successful business peasants and illiteral, illiterate shantytown entrepreneurs, would pluck themselves out of their muck by their own homemade sandal straps. Just think of it. Hundreds of millions of peasants working as micro-individuals, taking on micro-loans, making micro-rational investments into their micro-businesses, dutifully paying their micro-loan payments on time, and working in concert to harness the deregulated power of the markets to collectively lift their society out of poverty. It's a grand neoliberal vision. To that end, Omidyar has directed about a third, a third of the Omidyar Network Investment Fund, or about a hundred million, a million, to support the micro lending industry. The foundation calls this initiative financial inclusion. Shockingly, micro loans aren't all that they're cracked up to be. After years of observation and multiple studies, also linked below in the same article, it turns out that the people benefiting most from these microloans are the big global financial players. Hedge funds, banks, and the usual Wall Street hucksters. Meanwhile, the majority of the world's micro debtors are either no better off or they've been sucked into a morass of crippling debt and even deeper poverty which offers no escape but death. The SKS microfinance through an Omidyar backed Indian micro lender whose predatory lending practices and aggressive collection tactics have caused a rash of suicides across India. Omidyar funded SKS through Unitas a microfinance private equity fund bankrolled by the Omidyar network to the tune of at least 11.7 million. They both they boosted SKS in its promotional materials as a microlender that's serving the rural poor in India. And it exemplifies a company that's providing people with a means to address their needs and improve their lives. In 2010, SKS made headlines and stirred up bitter controversy about the role that profits should play in anti-poverty initiatives when the company went public with an IPO that generated about 358 million, giving SKS a market valuation of more than 1.6 billion. The IPO made millions for its wealthy investors, including the Omidyar-backed Unitas Fund, which earned a cool 5 million profit from the SKS IPO, according to Puget Sound Business Journal. Some were bothered, but others saw it as proof that the power of the markets could be harnessed to succeed where traditional charity programs supposedly hadn't. So, this was the controversy surrounding that venture. Then, of course, reality set in. And this reality is going to be talked about in the next video.